We'd like to begin our webinar by acknowledging that we are that we are gathering today across Treaty 6, 7, and 8 territory, as well as the Métis Nation of Alberta and Métis Settlement Territory. These are traditional meeting places and homes for many Indigenous peoples, including the Anishibe, the Blackfoot, the Cree, Dene, Nakota Sioux, Ojibwe, Stony Nakota, Sutina, Soto, and the Inuit and Métis peoples. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories, and in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration, we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities. In this first session, we'll be spending time on defining and conceptualizing positive mental health, including highlighting the difference between positive mental health and mental illness. We'll talk about the comprehensive school health approach, addressing the questions of what is it and how does the model promote the development of healthy school communities. And finally, we'll illustrate how this comprehensive school health framework connects to the Alberta Education's student competencies. So, let's get started. Part one of our webinar series, I'd like to pose a couple of questions for you to consider. What's the difference between mental health and mental illness? In the chat box, what role do you currently play in promoting mental health in schools? As you take your responses into the chat box, I will highlight a few ways that we know parents and guardians can support the mental health of their children. Perhaps you'll find yourself typing something similar. Parents can support positive mental health habits at home, have an awareness of signs of mental health concerns, support their child in obtaining the supports needed, provide information to school staff and service providers that support their child, support communication between home, school, and community, collaborate with service providers and school staff, and engage in service when and to the extent that it's appropriate. Did you know that the terms mental health and mental illness are often confused? Sometimes people think mental health and mental illness mean about or exactly the same thing. And even when people understand them to be different concepts, many use a mix of the concepts to define them. So why are the concepts of mental health and mental illness confused? The following may be a few of the reasons. First, mental health and mental illness are often used interchangeably. We often call mental illness specialists mental health clinicians. If we have a mental illness that requires treatment, we often go to a mental health facility or a mental health unit at a hospital. Because these terms are used interchangeably, it leads to confusion about what they actually mean. In reality, we know that five in five people have mental health, while one in five have a mental illness. In the course of a lifetime, not all people will have a mental illness, but everyone will struggle or have a challenge with their mental health or well-being. It's the same as having challenges with our physical health from time to time. However, we all have some level of mental health at any given time in our lives. Second, historically, we haven't always talked about or defined the concept of mental health very well, and we're still learning how to measure it. Mental health or positive mental health is complex, and it's comprised of skills and attitudes that are related to our emotional, psychological, spiritual, and social well-being. Mental health also includes our ability to enjoy life and deal with the challenges that we face. So let's try to conceptualize mental health by looking at our physical health first. So if I asked you to rate your physical health along the continuum on the screen, where the left-hand slide is physically ill and the right side is physically healthy, could you do it? Take a moment to think about where you would place yourself along the line now. Did you find it pretty easy to place yourself along the line? Now, if you were a person who has a chronic illness such as asthma or diabetes, is it still possible to be physically healthy, even though you have a physical illness? If you were to have a chronic physical illness, could you place yourself along the continuum when one end is healthy and one end is not? As you can see, the continuum isn't enough. A continuum suggests that the absence of illness is health, but in reality that's not true. 
As you can see, a simple continuum doesn't work because our physical health, or to describe our physical health, and in the same way, it doesn't work to describe our mental health either. What actually works is to consider health or uh, physical or mental as different and independent from illness. In the model that's now on your screen, this is a more accurate way to think about mental health. This diagram helps us to visualize the two concepts, mental health and mental illness. You can have a better look at the details of this graph in the Alberta Education document, Working Together to Support Mental Health in Alberta Schools. A link to this document is in this session's resource list. The important areas to focus on in the graph for the purpose of this webinar are the two axes. The vertical, or green axis, represents mental health, ranging from good mental health at the top to poor mental health. And the horizontal, or the blue axis, represents mental illness ranging from no mental illness on the right hand side to severe mental illness on the left. This diagram suggests that even though someone may have a mental illness, they could be considered to have good mental health and someone without a mental illness can still experience mental health problems. Looking at more detail for each quadrant, starting in the top left. So if we look at the top left, so this would be somebody uh, who, who might have high mental illness, but also high mental health. Uh, this could be a, a well-functioning person uh, with, with a diagnosed mental illness, but has lots of social supports and is able to uh, do and cope quite well with the stresses of everyday life. Uh, moving along to the top right, this would be someone with low mental illness and high mental health. Again, a highly functioning person without a mental illness uh, is successful and able to do and cope quite well, also has a lot of social supports in their life. If we move on to the bottom right, uh, these would be people with low mental health, uh, but low mental illness or no mental illness. So while not having a diagnosed mental illness, they still may not be coping very well with the stresses of everyday life. They may have low social support networks, lack of friendships and relationships, and difficulty managing the challenges of life. Finally, moving on to the bottom left, uh, we're in the area of high mental health, or high mental illness and low mental health. A person here uh, does have, may have a diagnosed mental illness um, and does not have the social supports, networks, friendships, relationships, and supportive environment to keep them mentally healthy. It's very difficult in this position to manage the challenges of life. Um, and people in this quadrant uh, may, may end up institutionalized or on an acute or long-term basis. What's important to understand with this model is that if you compare the function of someone who has a mental illness and high level of mental health, someone in the top left, if you compare them with someone who has no mental illness but low mental health, someone in the bottom right, the person who has a mental illness and good mental health, the person in the top left, functions better than the person with no mental illness and low mental health. So what we're here to do today is focus on strategies that prove, improve positive mental health for all, which are strategies that would keep everyone, regardless of whether they have a mental illness or not, above the blue line. So what is the definition of positive mental health? The Public Health Agency of Canada defines positive mental health as the capacity of each of us to feel, think, and act in ways that enhance our ability to enjoy life and deal with the challenges we face. It's a positive sense of emotional and spiritual well-being that respects the importance of culture, equity, social justice, interconnections, and personal dignity. Having good mental health means that you can enjoy life, can deal with life's challenges, can recognize and manage emotions, can have good relationships, and show respect for all people, including culture, equity, social justice, and personal dignity. The value of positive mental health is demonstrated through clear benefits to school staff, students, and schools, families, and parents as well. And the benefits include decreased emotional distress, increased school attendance, staying in school longer, higher grades and test scores, uh, and decreased decreased substance use. We all know that everyone has mental health and there are ways that we can improve poor or low mental health. Remember from the previous diagram, strategies to get everyone above the horizontal blue line. And school settings play an integral role in supporting positive mental health. 
Schools are a place where students spend most of their time. They're a source of social connection, and schools that foster social and emotional skills across the entire school population create caring and supportive environments. Therefore, working together to support mental health in schools is a shared responsibility. Excellent. Thanks, Matt. I'm going to take over from here. So, as Matt said, uh, supporting positive mental health for students. So it's a shared responsibility. So we're looking at shared responsibility among students themselves, school employees, so whether that's teachers, education assistants, administrative staff, school bus driver, operator, um, etc. The list goes on. Healthcare providers, and of course parents. And as parents, a main part of supporting mental health for children and youth is to foster that collaboration between places where children live, learn, and play. Uh, parents are the connectors between schools, communities, and their homes. And we know that positive mental health needs to be supported across all of those domains. There's no one place or one strategy that can create all the conditions that children and youth need to flourish. Um, therefore, we need to share the responsibility of supporting mental health and coordinate our efforts to have a collective impact on improving health and education. And the model we use to coordinate those efforts is called the Comprehensive School Health Approach, which is illustrated on the diagram on your screen. Um, and I'll talk about what Comprehensive School Health School Health is and why we recommend this model. So uh, the definition on your screen there is uh, that Comprehensive School Health is an internationally recognized framework for supporting improvements in students' educational outcomes while addressing school health in a planned, integrated, and holistic way. Um, this quote or the definition comes from the Joint Consortium for School Health which is a partnership of 25 ministries of health and education across Canada. Uh, they work to promote a comprehensive school health approach to student wellness, as well as student success for all children and youth. Um, so when we talk about comprehensive school health, we're talking about um, that it's more than what's taught in class. It's not just about a health class. Uh, it's about all the different ways a school can support their students in being healthy. It builds on strengths and activities that are already happening in schools and aims to develop them into sustainable activities that support a healthy school culture. It's about supporting school health through multiple components, which I'll touch on in a moment, uh, and can be applied in a variety of areas. Um, so that includes healthy eating, active living, positive mental health, etc. Um, there are several terms used to describe uh, comprehensive school health, so a uh, similar approach. Um, you might hear terms like health promoting schools, coordinated school health, a whole school approach. Uh, regardless of the terminology, they all incorporate the same principles. Uh, so you might be asking yourself, why take a comprehensive school health approach? Uh, we know that health and education are interdependent, so they feed off of each other. Healthy students are better learners, and better educated individuals are healthier. The research has shown that comprehensive school health is an effective way to enhance that linkage between health and education, so it improves both of those outcomes and encouraging healthy behaviors that last a lifetime. So in the classroom, comprehensive school health facilitates improved academic achievement and can lead to fewer behavioral problems as well. In the broader school environment, it helps students develop the skills they need to be physically and emotionally healthy for life. Um, and comprehensive school health recognizes that healthy stu students learn better and achieve more, understands that schools can directly influence students' health and behaviors, they're an effective setting for that, encourages healthy lifestyle choices that promote students' health and well-being. Um, comprehensive school health incorporates health into all aspects of school and learning. Um, it links health and education issues in their systems and needs a partic participation and support of families and the community at large. So um, it, again, it goes back to that shared responsibility for uh, health. 
and promoting positive mental health. Um, so it also comes back to that common vision uh, and harmonizing those actions amongst health and education partners and other sectors as well um, to try and coordinate those efforts so that we part pool our resources and develop action plans together uh, with schools in mind. Um, this whole school model helps to build capacity to incorporate well-being as an essential aspect of student achievement. So when actions and all four components are harmonized or they're working together, students are supported to realize their full potential as learners and as healthy, productive members of society. Uh, so now I'll just touch on the components of comprehensive school health. This approach has four distinct but interrelated pillars, uh, which are shown on the diagram there on your screen. So school health promotion initiatives that include strategies related to all components are the ones that are going to be the most effective. So for example, if we want to improve mental health in schools, we want all of these areas working together towards that common goal. So we need to have policies in place that support positive mental health. We have to have partnerships that support positive mental health and value positive mental health. Our social and physical environments need to be set up to be supportive of positive mental health. And we need to teach each other about different components of mental health so that all of these pieces are working together to create a culture of wellness. Uh, this framework supports the goal of Alberta education in that students develop student learner competencies so they can successfully navigate their life and learning. Um, so that's kind of an overview of comprehensive school health. Uh, we can get deeper into each of these components in webinar number two, I believe, so stay tuned for that down the road. Uh, for now, I'll pass it over to Michelle to further the links of comprehensive school health, wellness, uh, and the student learner competencies. At this time, I think we've got a bit of time to dedicate to questions so far. So I'm just wondering if any of our listeners have questions on um, the, the information that Matt shared about mental health and uh, if anyone has any questions about the information that Kate shared in the comprehensive school health. If you have a question, just go ahead and enter it into the chat room and we'll address it. I know I worked in a school that um, followed components of the comprehensive school health um, and it, we as a school did because our, our school jurisdiction did. I'm just wondering how other um, families how you've experienced this model, or if you have it all. So Celeste, um, our dress in junior, senior high. Yeah, they focus on a couple of components. So this is a, this is a great way for for parents to um, to get involved or to see where there are um, where there's room um, to come together to support schools in in either their their focus for the year or focusing on pardon me parents can offer support in the areas where they see that there might be supports needed just to further that conversation Michelle um, I would add that, would add that um, it's likely that schools are using this model sometimes it might be hard to um, that if they're using the model or not or following it. It might require a little bit of investigation to know if uh, all of those pieces are at play. Um, but if you're a part of a school health team um, or a planning group or something like that, these are definitely components that you'd want to look at to um, try and develop the, the strategies that you're putting in place uh, to make it that kind of long-term, sustainable, lasting initiative. Yeah, sometimes it, it is hard to see how um, supporting health is, is going in the background of, of the school. But Kate, I like that point that you make that um, sometimes parents have to 
dig around and investigate to see um, where these components are being activated. Um, yeah, and talking about the the parent council and and um, just even you know things like offering partnerships and services. Um, you know, if you run a business or you you know know the the owner of the local grocery store and you want to um, provide healthy snacks, um, perhaps healthy fruit in the office for kids that don't have lunches, or if you run a business and and they're, they're, um, the school is participating in a school wide wellness activity, you know maybe there's a a partnership there that you can you can offer. Um, to support their their healthy school initiatives, there's a lot of different um, there's a lot of different ways that we can support schools. And being a parent myself, and also being a teacher, um, I I do see the disconnect. And sometimes, um, you know, we have to recognize that sometimes that support is just starting the conversation. Oh, good question, Matt. Okay, Marcia, your comment um, just reminds me of future topics in our in our webinars down the road for this series, um, and we're going to address um, that component, partnerships and services, and and policy as well as social and physical environments, and all of those components come together to support um, reaching out to families you know, students and their families in, in making sure that they feel welcome and and we can give you some, we'll, we'll be giving you more strategies on how to um, reach out to those parents. And while I'm talking here, I'm also thinking about, and my friends from Alberta Health Services, you're going to get the title right, it's the safe, safe and Caring, welcoming, safe, and caring, respectful learning environment. Environment. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So that um, maybe maybe Kate or Matt, you can put that link into the chat room. But that's a link to um, Alberta Education, and there are ways there for um, parents to support schools and schools to support parents um, and you know there's checklists and stuff like that um, that perhaps you know a, a group of, of parent council can can take a, um, an, uh, a piece of that and modify uh, take a piece of that policy and sort of model it to um, or modify it so that it is more suitable for, for parents to, for parent councils to look at. Oh, thanks, Matt. That's, that's there. Great. Okay, so um, are there any other questions? Okay, so I will move on to student learning competencies. So on your screen, you see the eight um, competencies there. These eight competencies are derived from the Ministerial Order on Student Learning from 2013. The competencies are a comprehensive look at the knowledge, skills, and attitudes that students develop in order to be successful in their everyday lives. If you're interested in learning more about the competencies after this webinar, please access them on uh, the resources page at the end of the slides. And I am going to be sharing these slides with uh, everyone here today through the chat window. And um, we've populated the slides with um, links to all of the to all of the websites and resources that we talk about throughout the this session. And so Alberta Education and ERLC both have um, two websites dedicated to the competencies. The competencies for a teacher um, 
really talk about, or they bring to life that, that piece, those skills, knowledge, and attitudes that are supposed to be developed um, through uh, learning activities in class. So competencies are things like critical thinking, problem solving, collaboration, creativity and innovation, communication, personal growth and well-being, managing information, and cultural and global citizenship. So when we put a wellness lens to, um, to these ideas, if you look at critical thinking, actually, yeah, if you look at managing information, we've got the, the uh, verbs there, share, sort, find, and use. So when your child is sharing information either you know, through social media or is receiving um, information through text, so on and so forth, um, you, know, you want them to be competent in what they share and how they view what is shared to them. You also want them to be able to, to sort through all the messages that they're getting through social media or, or other forms of communication. You want them to be able to find um, things that are important to them, not only just their, you know, their jacket before they head to school, but you also want them to be competent at finding help or finding uh, a phone number that they can call for support or finding an address. And, and uh, the last um, verb there is, is use. We want them to be competent users of the information that they receive and um, be able to use it so that they um, benefit from the information that they do receive. So that's one way that managing information can live through a wellness lens. Now, obviously, if we were in a classroom, managing information would be more like, OK, please turn to your partner and share your viewpoint. Or I'm going to give you a, um, you know, a, a box of math manip manipulatives, and I'm going to ask you to sort through them. Or I'm going to ask you to find the definition of something. Or I'm going to ask you to use this technology um, in a certain way. So we see that competencies can span between school and classrooms um, very easily. The next one, problem solving. We have plan, persevere, solve, and explore. So if I'm talking about classroom, then I'm talking about um, can a student make a plan to finish their homework? Can a student persevere through um, maybe their, their uh, difficult learning activity. Um, I'm going to ask children to solve problems, and I'm going to ask them to explore information or explore um, a part of the forest or explore something on a field trip. And so it's pretty easy to see those connections to classroom, but when, and it's also, um, sorry, also when you're asking them to, to look at this through a wellness lens, then when we want them to problem solve, we're asking them maybe to plan um, you know, when to use their medication. So have a plan. And have a plan, maybe have a plan for, for how they're going to make, make some friends. Or maybe a plan to finish their, their homework so they don't have such a, a great degree of anxiety about you know, tons of homework. We're going to ask them to persevere um, at home. And so we're going to ask them, you know, don't give up. Um, um, you, have to, you have to stick with it. You have to keep trying. Through a wellness lens, we, when we ask our kids to solve, we might ask them to, to you know, solve that problem of, of you're having a difficult time making friends. What are some things that you can do to um, get, get started on the path to making friends? Um, we might ask them to solve um, you know, the problem of, of not getting enough sleep or solve the problem of, of 
being hungry. Um, so encouraging kids to become com competent in problem solving at home um, closely relates to problem solving in schools where, again, we ask them to make a plan for an essay. We ask them to persevere through, through a difficult learning task. So we make these um, connections through all of, all eight um, competencies. And with collaboration, you know, we have trust, compromise, contribute, and support. We asked, as a teacher, I asked students to do those things every day, and you're asking them to do them at home. If we can, if we can make that link between what they're learning at home and what they're learning at school, then that provides them that opportunity to transfer what they're learning in, in let's say, transfer what they're learning at school and take it out into the real world with them. And that is how we get to a deeper learning. Um, and that's when we know when, when a child can transfer what they've learned at home to a learning activity at school, then we know that there is deep understanding and a competency um, in that area. I am just uh, wondering if anyone has um, any ideas about how you see competencies playing a role in your children's lives. Marsha, I'm just reading your, your question. If this is not just happening in health, can you give an example of when you're asking them to use this with regards to mental health during the day? Oh, you mean if this is not just happening in health class? Right. And you know what? That, you bring up a really good point because um, being healthy doesn't, we don't, we, we don't just, um, you know, practice being healthy for 40 minutes and then, and then walk away and we're reckless throughout the day, right? Everyone needs to attend to, to their personal wellness all the time and it should be happening in math and it should be happening in, in social studies and it should be happening in, in health. Um, these competencies need to be practiced all the time. They need to, the students need to have opportunities to develop these competencies so that they come to a deep understanding of what it means to critically think and communicate. And, and then they can transfer that knowledge over. Um, an example of doing this in, in social studies um, would be, let's say I, I look at critical thinking. Um, so I will ask students to reflect on um, the lesson and share what it meant to them. So if we've read a case study about, let's say, uh, let's say we read a case study of um, uh, a person who was interned um, during the, the, or was interned in the Japanese internment camps um, during the Second World War. I would ask students to reflect on that person's um, story and maybe ask them to connect it to feelings of um, being bullied or have, you know, ha I might ask them to put themselves in, in the same boat where they haven't felt welcome, where they have felt um, as though they've been judged unfairly. Um, and get them to relate their own personal feelings in that way to, uh, you know, the, the internment case study. Another example, let's say if we jump over to goals, um, if we're talking about, let's say, being mindful in, in math class before I give students an exam, I might uh, get them to do some, some breathing, some breathing exercises to reduce the um, anxiety that they might be feeling over the, the math test. Um, I might ask them to, um, I'm, in, in science, I might ask them to look at the consequences of, of new technology and um, to how, the, how, we, how actions have consequences and what do those consequences um, how do those consequences impact things like our health um, and other areas? 
Um, I'll just share an example as well, Michelle. Um, if we're looking at maybe a child who's had a, a problem with a friend, um, we might look at that managing information for them to share their story, sort out some of the facts, um, find the information that's useful for them, um, go through some problem solving, so that planning, helping to solve the problem, we might touch on communication and collaboration about um, respect for each other, listening to each other, sharing, um, and contributing to the conversation. Um, so a student might develop these competencies to use outside of the classroom, we hope, of course, um, and develop that deep understanding of the competencies. And then we hope to develop the school setting to allow that exchange to happen. So create a space where they feel uh, safe and cared for. They feel that they can um, be open and honest. They're in a safe setting. They're supported to have these conversations with friends and to go through that managing information process or problem solving process with them. That was awesome, Kate. I am going to put uh, Matt on the spot here to um, address the next slide. Well. Okay, so by focusing on, and this slide kind of helps to tie um, all of all of these uh, concepts together now today. So by focusing on the components of comprehensive school health, school communities can work together to support the development of the skills, knowledge, and attitudes that children need to successfully navigate their life, learning, and work, the student competencies that Michelle was just referring to. Uh, so for example, um, a school's welcoming, caring, respectful, and safe learning environments policy, um, and I use this example because um, all schools in Alberta do have a, a policy based on the welcoming, caring, respectful, and safe learning environments. Um, so for example, this policy can help to support the communication student competency. Uh, for example, these policies set the expectations that students uh, consider all perspectives and communicate with each other respectfully and can help even to provide or clarify language that all students can use to support respectful communication. So in this example, we're linking um, a positive mental health, uh, the welcoming, caring, respectful, and safe learning environments uh, policy. Um, according to the comprehensive school health approach with a, the student competency of communication. And so um, as you begin to think of all these linkages, uh, you can just imagine all of the possibilities between students' skills, knowledge, and attitudes. So in, uh, I'm going to give a moment for you to post some examples in the chat room yourselves. Um, Kate and Michelle, I believe, have uh, several other examples that they're going to add to the chat box as well. So I'll just give everyone a moment to, uh, to put a few examples in the chat box of uh, maybe how working within a, a, a pillar or a component of the comprehensive school health approach um, can work to support uh, one of the student competencies. See, Kate's put an example in there. Thank you, Kate. Yeah, in my example, um, I just built on Matt's example um, and also talked about how student creativity and innovation um, is supported by creating an environment where students feel they're supported to think differently, take risks, and apply knowledge in new innovative ways. And a policy like the welcoming, safe, caring, respectful learning environment policy will hopefully help to do that. And I see Michelle uh, put an example in there as well. Healthy I, school. Sorry, I just want to interrupt. I wasn't sure if I let everyone know that I'm posing as Christine Kwong in the chat room. So if you see Christine Kwong in, in the chat room, it's actually Michelle Jones. And the real Christine is Christine Kwong too. So yeah, I apologize for not making that um, apparent earlier on. I know I told some of the earlier um, people in the session, but I kind of forgot to let everyone know again. Sorry. 
No problem. Thank you for that reminder, Michelle. I know it could be confusing for some of those on the line. Um, I see a question from Kathy here. Um, she'd love to see some student opinions on whether they are feeling supported in their school environments. Is there any plan for student input in this process? That's a good question, uh, Kathy. Um, off the top of my head, I mean, at, at um, I know uh, individual schools would probably look into, um, you know, surveying their students or getting input on uh, whether the school environment is supportive of them. I'm not aware of, of anything um, at, at our organization's level to kind of collect this type of input, um, but maybe, perhaps Kate or Michelle uh, might be able to add a few comments to that question as well. I would just say that um, student voice or student input is really an important component of comprehensive school health. So we look at a variety of stakeholders having uh, their input into the process. Um, so we kind of have comprehensive school health as the foundation of uh, how we want um, to influence healthy school communities, but then we also have uh, a process model that we follow around developing that shared vision and creating a team um, and gathering input and data. So that comes from student voice and uh, we invite students to be a part of that process of de creating a healthy school community. Um, and I think when we link it to the student competencies, um, asking them questions around the competencies, if they're feeling supported around mental health or are they feeling that they have a safe and welcoming environment, are excellent posing questions to students when we have the school health teams going um, to get their input and then make changes from there. I do know of a school division I'm working with currently is looking at a student voice project um, to have some input into their mental health strategic plan as they move forward. Um, so although it's not specifically around the competencies, it is asking them questions about um, feeling connected and belonging in school, uh, ideas for change, um, and ways that we can move forward. Okay, great. Th so thanks for the examples in the box. Thanks for the um, added comments, Kate and, and Michelle. Um, so hopefully um, this has, has kind of given you a bit of a taste of um, how these things all kind of come together. Now as we sort of approach the end of uh, this first part of our webinar, I just want to take a moment to reflect on everything that we have uh, covered today. And uh, we've thrown a lot at you. We've talked about positive mental health. We've talked about the comp uh, comprehensive school health approach. Uh, and we've talked about uh, student competencies, the, the knowledge, skills, and attitudes that all students need to have. Um, and so we just have a, a brief reflection plan for you as well. Um, and I'll invite you to um, work within the chat box here. Um, before I do though, I just a quick reminder as well that you'll also receive a link in your email to provide feedback on this first webinar. Uh, so please just take a moment once you receive that to let us know how we did today uh, and, what, and what you think. Um, so as I mentioned, as we come to an end of this session, we'd like to lead you through just a brief reflection. Um, so as I'm talking, please type your thoughts into the chat box. Uh, as we ask you about your experience in this session. And I'll give you a moment to respond to each of the following four questions. Um, so take a moment now and follow along. Please tell us things that you found today to be emotionally engaging. Uh, something that maybe inspired you, um, excited you, something that en engaged you emotionally in today's session. Give the chat box just a moment to fill up. As I see many of you are typing. So Jen, the graph with mental health and mental illness was a great graphic. Thanks, Jen. That's a great comment. Enthusiastic and supportive parents. I agree, Kate. The ideas of how parents can help schools. 
the website provided some examples. So that's great, Angela. Thank you. Okay, so some great responses coming in here. Um, uh oh, that's okay. <laughs> Let's try that again. There we go. So as we, oh, we'll have to, there we go. Um, so please write something in the chat box that you found uh, tangible and practical today. Maybe a strategy that you heard um, or a new web link or a resource. And as you reflect on that, Please take a moment to think about something that you found thought-provoking from today's session. And feel free to type that into the chat box. Let's inspire some conversation here. Differences between mental health and mental illness, the concept of mental health and mental illness being different. So there's a theme coming out here. Great. Kathy, more motivated to get involved with your children's schools to help move the process along. Excellent. So that leads us to our last reflection question. One step that you think you'll take after today's webinar, um, maybe that's a sharing resources or having conversation with your own children or bringing what you learned back to school council. Really like the verbs. They feel like practical ways to discuss mental health. Excellent. So I know there's only a few minutes left, and as you continue to type the, the one step that you will take after today's webinar into your box, I'm just going to turn it back over to Michelle to just tell you um, a little bit more about the remaining webinar series and to see if there are any questions on the line. I think my audio is on now. Um, thanks, Matt. We've got some resources up on this slide here. I've shared the um, webinar with you, the link to the webinar in the chat room. Um, you should be able to make a copy. If you can't actually make a copy, um, just email me and uh, I'll reset the privileges but hopefully hopefully shouldn't have a problem um, so these are the sites that are all linked that'll help you uh, learn more about student learner competencies the comprehensive school health and mental health um, I included the Alberta Health website as well as the Alberta Family and Wellness website they've got some really good videos there um, that are uh, a fun way to talk about um, brain development and, and mental health. So please join us again on October 24th, 7 o'clock to 8 p.m. Uh, we'll be hosting our second session. Um, and although this session could function as a standalone, if you uh, were, I just would lo love it if you invited um, more people to join us. If you are going to invite them to join us, they have to still register. And in doing so, um, you should know that session two and session three are fairly dependent on, on each other. So you sort of need to register for both the second session and the third session. I'm hoping to see all of you and five friends back because we really want to get the message out that there are ways that parents can be supporting schools and schools can support parents and we all have a responsibility to support um, mental health in our in our school. On the screen there you see Matt, Kate and my uh, email, our phone numbers. Um, we've got the description there for the, the next sessions and yeah I guess 
Uh, we'll be doing it again with, a, with Adobe Connect. So when you register, we'll be sending out another Adobe Connect um, email. So I am um, done. Yeah, it's 8 o'clock. Pretty good timing, everybody. Um, I just uh, I want to echo what Kate said there in the chat room. I really do um, appreciate everyone who took the time out to hear this message today. And uh, I believe you can register for the session right away. If those of you can't remember how you registered, if you look on your screen, you just go to uh, erlc.ca and learning opportunities. Um, you can do chronological listing and just scroll down until you hit um, October 24th and register right there. So this one has the, the day one and the day two of the next two sessions and, and just tell everybody you know and this is no charge. Um, both the ERLC and um, Alberta Health Services are dedicated to um, helping support mental health in uh, Alberta schools. So we would love to see you back. And yeah, I guess that's it. So um, anyone have any further concerns or questions, please uh, don't be shy. Uh, please uh, feel free to email us. And we'd love to hear from you. And we hope to see you back on October 24th. Thanks for Matt and Kate for co-hosting and Christine for uh, providing um, the technology help in the background and thank you everyone for your patience um, with some of the, the uh, dropped audio and split screens. So we'll, Good night, we'll talk to everyone later. Good night Kate. <laughs>